It's January the 10th, 2015, a very, very cold Saturday morning. And I am standing here by Premium Mini Buses and Cars Limited, about to go in and interview the lady who started it all, Vera. And I am drawn to this, where it says, to our valued customers, because that's what this company is. Every customer and every person that works for Vera, are, they are valued and they are individual and they are treated as gold. And that's what we're here to find out more about. So welcome to our story about premium taxis. Hi, Wickham. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the community show. As you know, in this show, we interview some of these great people in the community and bring them to our new TV station. So today is January the 10th, Saturday, and we're in High Wycombe in Desborough Road, sitting with Vera Carotti. That's right. Who is the founder of Premium Cars, which used to be called Premier Cars. That's right. It's Premium Minibuses. Premium Minibuses. That's right. Okay. Premium Minibuses and Cars. Yeah. Okay. So Premium or Premier, it means the best. It means quality. It means number one. Yep. So how did you come up with the name? I didn't. I bought it. Oh, okay. I bought it in 1983. Right. Okay. And that's when you started to run When company. I started. I worked here myself from 1981, mm -hmm. having fallen out with a previous employer and looking for something to do as a job without perhaps the ties that you might have if you were going into London or uh, past... Uh, um, what can I say, uh, past employments, which is where mm -hmm. I'd always worked in, in London, of, of the big companies. Okay, so why taxi driving? I mean, it, 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 it developed rather than a, rather than a um, <laughs> deliberate. Um, I'd fallen out, as I said, I'd, I'd been doing parcel distribution for a printing company, not very far from this office actually, about 200 yards. And I'd fallen out with them, and rather than in a fit of pique, I walked into the nearest place that I thought could give me employment without too much hassle. And that's exactly where they said, yes, come and deliver parcels. Right. And um, I said, yes, I would. Well, parcels very soon developed into tax driving. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started. Okay, so then you decided you actually wanted to run a company. Is that what you're saying? Well, what I decided as was uh, after I'd worked here about eight or nine months, and the owner of the company was showing distinct signs of wanting to go. And I thought, oh, well, I could run this company. I could mm. run this. It was quite small at the time, only four or five people. I could run this. I could, I could do this quite easily. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, it was probably very ambitious at the time because it wasn't an easy trade. But you've but, done it. But it looked easy at the time. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, you see, this is the thing. When a woman gets an idea in her head, you just go out there and you create it. Now, we've talked about this a little bit over the last couple of months, and you were saying, you know, it's, it's absolutely fascinating to have a woman running her own taxi company. It, it's, you know, you don't really find that that much, do you? No. It's, and particularly it's, not in the 80s. It, it, it was quite unusual even mm. then. That, um, but it just somehow adhered itself to my personality. I just have... Uh, um, that kind of personality that um, gets on with this kind of life. I'd, mm -hmm. I, I really can't explain it. I've no, I've no explanation for you, but it did work. It just felt right. It felt right. Mm -hmm. it, it worked very well. It suited me very well. I, I was raising two children at the time. Um, it was in a town where they were at school. It was it, every, Everything fitted very well for me. Mm. I don't know that it would, would work for another person, but it worked for me. Mm. So, I mean, sometimes people, um, they follow up on a dream that they had when they were a lot younger. No, Did no, you never no, have anything? No, any no, no. The only thing that I ever knew, the only part of this that, that is um, what I wanted when I was young, was I always wanted to work for myself. I never wanted to be somebody's... I, I never wanted to work for a boss. So I knew when I got to a certain age, I wanted to be my, my own person and run my own show, but did had no clue in what field it was going to be. Right, OK. And then it kind of fell in your lap. 
Yeah. It's really synchronistic. You walked in and there it, it was, the it, job. <laughs> it developed. It developed. Mm. It's purely um, mm. coincidental, but that's how we've got to where we are. Amazing. So how did it feel to be in a world that is mainly run by men? Well, that's, that, was, that, that, that was the appeal of it, because I have a, a, a background in... Um, I was a rep. I was a company rep. Um, for 10, 12 years before I came into this. Mm -hmm. And when I, when, after my mother had died, and I could no longer do that because my, 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 Helen was very young. Yeah, you were saying the kids. Yeah. Helen was, it was very young. James wasn't all that long born. Um, so I could not go back to a, a full-time career repping job. Mm. Um, and that was when I went into this parcel distribution thing, which still yeah, sort of bordered on, on selling. And but how, how did it feel to be the only woman in, in this company? Did well, you, I was did you quite feel, used to it. I was quite, I was, oh, I was quite used to that mm -hmm. because in, in London, in, in selling in the late 70s, again, I was the only woman. Oh, I see, I see. I was the and only woman, so I was it. quite used to that. Mm. That was not, not unusual. Mm. So do you remember your first day? Yes, you remember I remember. Your first day running your own and company. It, and How did it feel? And believe it or not, now I remember specifically the first day that I came here and the first taxi fares that I did. And believe it or not, three out of the first five people that I took on that first day of taxi driving here in 1981 are still customers of mine today. Oh, isn't that wonderful? That's wonderful. That so is the absolute truth. That's wonderful. So built up a loyalty with you, and they've stayed with yes, you. Yes, that's absolutely right. <clears throat> and what about the drivers? Do you, do you have any drivers that have been with you from the beginning? Well, or? sadly, um, I had two drivers here that were here more or less from from day one, and one of them still works here. The other one very sadly died. So again, coming coming back to the whole thing about you running your own company, and you you basically you knew what to do. You knew how to set this up. You knew how to move on with it. So, how did you get all these ideas? Did you did you have a mentor? Did you have someone that introduced you into no, this world? No, not really. No, I had a mentor in the selling world who taught me the way to speak to people, um, to use nice words. One of his favourite words was delightful, uh -huh. and I still use delightful a lot today. Um, and I have found that. You can get through most things with the right kind of language, mm. if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. And that's that's mm. essentially mm. what this has been. A lot of hard work. Yeah. Because as as somebody was reminding me this morning, you do everything here, which I do. I I mm -hmm. still do all the invoicing. Certainly, the, the junior bookkeeping. I have an accountant, of course, that carries on and does the senior stuff. But certainly, the the element of the bookkeeping comes from me. In the first, I do all the invoicing. I do all the day to day work downstairs with the drivers, as you will have seen. Mm. So it's it's a one woman show, really, isn't it? You're running the whole show. Um, <laughs> as we've gone on now, I have now taken in a junior partner who came into the company about three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what I need. Okay. Now I've I've kind of talked to Helen, as you know, Helen, your daughter, yes. who's a good friend, <laughs> um, about how your company developed and how for for a few years you felt like you weren't really getting anywhere, no, that's right. and then something happened. You got that break. Something actually happened. happened. So. What actually happened oh, that we, opened up your We looked for solid school contract work, or solid contract work, which basically is schools. Okay. And we got the first, I think, school contract around 1989. Mm -hmm. And from then, with solid money coming into the company, being less dependent on maybe the phone would ring, maybe the phone wouldn't ring. Uh, but as soon as you get solid contract work, into a company, then obviously you begin to make your way up the ladder, and that started around 1989. So, what was that actually? Picking children up, taking them to school, bringing yes, them home. That's it. That that's what you mean, and that was actually what actually created more business for you. Yeah. And made you unique in some way. Were, were you the? Only I think company so. I, I I wouldn't say we were the only company, but we, we very soon became. It became foremost in that in 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 in, in this company's mm. world. You know because to do the school contracts 
and get the solid money behind the company so that you could start to enlarge the fleet, make a better fleet, better quality drivers and so on. Mm, okay. So that was actually the, that's the business the side beginning. Of, that's the business side uh, of it. Right, okay. So what's the other side to it? Oh, the other side is the fun side of it. Well, this is it. You're so passionate about it. And you, it, this is your dream. Yeah. You're living your dream. Well, I, I am in that sense, in the sense that it's what I always wanted. It's mm. what it, the, the freedom of it, the um, sense of it's down to me to, to, to make the decisions. Mm. And I live, live or die by them, don't I? Mm. Mm. But this is so important in life. We all have to find something that really resonates with us I'm and we're sure, passionate I'm about. I'm sure you feel exactly the same thing in your world. I can see it in your face when you talk about it. This yeah. is your baby. Yeah, that's right. And you kind of mention oh, this is, <laughs> I've often said, it's, it's quite well known in this office, that I think of this as my third child. Yes. You kind of mentioned as well that you feel like you run a bit of a school, like you're the headmistress. <laughs> that's, it's, it's, it's more <laughs> that kind of thing than any dominant power. I'm certainly not Alan Sugar. So give me an example, for example, uh, for what you mean about running it more like um, a school. You're the well, headmistress. And I've done the job, as, as is fairly obvious to everybody. So I know the pitfalls, I know the good bits and the bad bits of it. So when a driver comes to me and having made a mistake, perhaps, I will listen to what the mistake is and say to him, well, X or Y or Z should have happened. It hasn't happened, and this is the way we put it right. Mm. And I think that's rather headmistressy rather than any dominant. Yeah. So has there been a time where you thought, God, this isn't working, I really can't do this anymore? No, and no, never. You've never felt no, that? No, never, ever never. felt that. Uh, money was tight in the, in the Middle Ages, mm. and uh, I was very often in trouble with the bank and so on, but it never occurred to me to do anything other than... Mm drive it forward, which is, and most of it's, it's good. It's, it's amazing. Good. As I say, I find it absolutely fascinating because from my experience, I have to work with life coaches yeah. in order to keep that focus and that grounding and to be able to achieve the goals. And you seem to be able to do this anyway. Like, did, did you have anyone in your family at all no. that was very career-minded or... Oh, my mother, was a, my, mother, my mother was a shopkeeper. Oh. Um, that, so that's where perhaps the one bit of focus, she wasn't a particularly good businesswoman, but she uh, she ran her own little shop and she was happy in that little shop and I think probably this is an extension of that for me. So I do come from that kind of mm. background. So you saw that as you were growing up. And so your family, your mother is Italian, is that right? Your no, no my, no, my father's side were Italian. Oh, your father's Migrant Italian. here right. from about 1904. My mother's side were London people, people from London. Oh, okay. So are you a Wickham girl? No, no, no. no. <laughs> I was born right. um, not very far from Tottenham, rather infamous these days, I'm afraid. Um, and um, my, my London family come from um, that part of the world, Tottenham, Holloway, Mill Hill, around there. Um, so North London background. So how long have you been living in High Wycombe? Uh, we came out to Lane End, which is on the Marlow side of High Wycombe, um, in the early 50s. Oh, okay. And you settled here and, and had your family. And yes. So, yeah. And now you run, would you say, it is probably the most successful taxi business in the area? No, I one think of the most successful one of the most taxi, taxi. Yeah, there are two or three more that, mm -hmm. that do very well. But right. uh, we're certainly one of them. Do you have female drivers? We have had female drivers. Dear old Norma retired about right. three or four years ago, <laughs> and I've never, I've never found anybody that really could replace her. Oh, okay. It's not an easy trade for a woman. Right, uh, why is that? Well, because of the pressure of family. And no, I don't either. Or fear. The fear of violence, really. I mean, you, obviously, you could take uh, a woman on to do what's called contract work, but then it's, it's that is the side when family. They have their own children. Mm. They don't really want to be running around after somebody else's children yes. unless they're of a certain age, and mm. it doesn't always pay. So no, yeah. uh, since Norma left, I've I've found no no lady to replace her. Okay, so when when you decide to take on um, a driver, mm. you decide to employ someone. Is there a, a specific process that they need to normally go it comes for you? normally here because of the large Asian side of the mm -hmm. the business. It comes through recommendation. Okay. Somebody will find a driver that will say, oh, I don't know, 
Isaac is out of work and needs to um, uh, needs a job. He's very good. He's done this, that, and the other. And then I'll see him. And if I think that if I concur with what they say, and if there's a vacancy, sure. and uh, most of my drivers have been here a very long time, they, we only get vacancies about once a year. Oh, okay. It's, so it's, how many drivers have you got? Possibly? I think somebody was saying that they thought there were 70 drivers here. 70? Mm. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of drivers. A lot of drivers. <laughs> and also for the schoolwork, I have to employ people who are, uh, I think probably the word chaperone is probably the nearest mm. you're going to get to it. They call them passenger assistants. And we, uh, we, we employ probably about 20 of those too. Mm. Okay. Have you ever thought about driving. Yeah. yeah, no, I did. You've done your own, you've oh, done taxi driving. That's why I was saying to you earlier. Before, I've when done, you did the courier. I've done the job. So. No, no, I've actually done this job here. I, that's how I came Oh, here. I see. I, when I came here to work originally, that's what I came as. I came here to do part of the distribution. The, that, there wasn't enough in it. Mm. Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't really get enough pay out of it. So, took on the taxi work. Mm. And after I'd been here about nine months, then that was when I decided that I was going to try and raise the money and buy it. Of course. And yeah. after I bought it, then in order to keep it on the road, then I had to do all the taxi driving as well. Mm. So it was quite small originally. Um, there were only five cars and we used to sort of come in and take a job and go out and do it and, and, and so on. And then the next one would come in and sit by my desk and take mm -hmm. a job. So that's the way it was until about 1989 and that was when the, the contract work started to come in a more um, regular sense of money coming in able to mm. employ somebody to do the base and eventually it became obvious that it was better that I sit behind the desk and that started around early 90s 90, uh, 1990 okay and then you kind of you took yeah, over yeah so you just get in there and you do the job basically yeah as i say it's very similar to running theater you, when it's your passion and it's your baby you really have to know all the ins and outs and how this works yeah you know to get it working like a really good machine yeah so what's your favorite memory would you say or your favorite experience of of running of running premium, premium cars oh just the camaraderie really I think the camar camaraderie of, um, I mean, there have been some very funny incidents, really, that, you, you, that I could tell you about. Can you tell us some? Well, I'll tell, you, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a simple one. Some of the drivers here are not so familiar with um, areas, and everything in this last five years has been done by postcodes. And one particular driver was taking a group of elderly people from one of the care homes, down to and he was due to go to Eastbourne when he got there he said to the lead person of the elderly people I understand you want to go to Eastbourne could you give me a postcode please and the elderly man sort of looked at him and did nothing and anyway he got everybody settled down and he turned again to the elderly man and said have you got that postcode and the elderly man dug in his pocket and bought out a postcode. It wasn't the right postcode. Oh they ended up in Bournemouth. <laughs> and I gave, I gave them a postcode. Oh, bless. <laughs> so that must have been exciting for you. Hello, where are you? <laughs> so that's one of the funny incidents. No, that's one, of, one, of, one of the funny <laughs> incidents that I can remember. Yeah, there have been many of them. Uh, the small things that probably, speaking about them now, wouldn't appear mm. so funny, but they were funny at the time. Well, no, that is. <laughs> Funny at the time. Did they get there in the end? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> well, we can hear it's a very busy office, like the phones are ringing downstairs. Yeah, yeah. And no, there's nobody in this morning. Um, Someone answering the phone. Yeah, that, that, no, that's right. They're, um, the, the, the drivers are down there, mm. and obviously I've taken an hour's break to, to, to speak to you. Yeah. And um, I'll go back to it in a minute. <laughs> right. You must know how. Well, I mean, you cover what the whole of the country. Well, yes, we we've certainly done. We basically do this area. Ninety percent of our work is between here and London, or between here and Milton Keynes, or between here and the South Coast. Okay. But of course, you do occasionally get jobs whereby people want to go to quite unusual places. I mean, we've we've certainly taken people to Hull. We've taken people to Sheffield, we've taken people to Manchester, 
And I think one, you were asking me for a, a, a funny story. I don't know that this is so funny. But when, years ago, I had a driver here who, I'd met a chap from the RAF who needed to go to Lossiemouth. To where, sorry? Lossiemouth in Scotland. Oh, okay. Right where the, um, I think it's where the Polaris thing is up there. All oh, right. Anyway, I, I was very hesitant to let him go because I said to him, why not take a taxi to the nearest train station, which was, I think, at King's Cross, and take the train, it's much quicker, much faster. Mm -hmm. No, no, he doesn't want to do that. He wants to go by, by, ta by a taxi. And I said to him, well, you go, but I, 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 I'm highly suspicious of it. And of course, when he got to Lossy Mouth, the chap ran away. Oh, and he God. never did get paid. And I don't think that that particular, that particular, oh. dri that, that particular driver <gasps> resigned on the spot. Oh, my and, God. And, and, and he drove all the way down to Scotland. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? That must have been awful. Well... Awful. Hopefully, as I said to you, as, as I, no, no, it's it's quite rare, mm. quite rare. Once, once or twice a year. Mm. But as I've said to you, uh, sometimes what appears funny at the time, because I, mm. um, he was a rather, um, how can I put it? He was a, a rather arrogant man who, who really did think he knew everything, and we couldn't warn him mm. that you know there was something wrong with the job. Mm. People don't go. Even from from Ariad yeah. and Nap Hill to Lossy Mouth by taxi, you go to, to the nearest train station. That would have yeah. made complete sense. How much would that have cost? Well, it should have been a, even at the time, for some years ago, it would have been a five hundred pound talk. Goodness me! Oh God! <laughs> yeah, I can just imagine. I mean, have you had it? other people that have absconded and like that? Yeah, you, it's usually, you get that. It's kid. usually kids <laughs> and, a, and yeah. local two or three quid here, but it's not mm. the end of the world. But. That one was, was one that was, that was made <laughs> We're going to take a little break. And before yeah. we go, do you just want to tell um, our audience, uh, if they want to book a taxi, what number do they need to ring? 01494 532 885.